<laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Divert Creators podcast, guys. Really appreciate you joining us and sticking with us for, this is what, the 10th episode you're on? And I have with me a very awesome guest. So for the purposes of our audience, who may not know you, mm-hmm. you should, but could you introduce yourself and let them know what you do? Okay, my name's James Corbin. Um, I'm a model, I like to write, I produce TV, and then creative all, all, all around, innit? That is a lot. Yeah. And how did you get started? This quite, like, which was, which came first? Which came first? Um, okay, so, um, TV came first. Okay. Working in TV, working in television. Um, I studied it in university. Snap. Yeah, I studied in university when I was younger. Um, loved watching, like, TV programmes, reality TV, just the idea of how, think, how live shows. Mm-hmm. X Factor, Britain's Got Talent, Factor, yeah. like all these talent shows. I was like just obsessed with like live TV and entertainment. Mm-hmm. When as soon as I was old enough to go, I would go to like Britain's Got Talent, um, X Factor shows, you know, mm-hmm. in the live audience. You can just be in the audience. Yeah. And yeah, I go to secondary school and like force my friends to come along with me. Yeah. And like, yeah, we'd be we'd be quite bad. And we'd be making <laughs> jokes, like we'd be enjoying it. It was like very memorable moments. It was really fun. Not a lot of people realise you can just get tickets to go to these shows. Everyone was like, how much have got to pay? I'm not trying to pay, you know. No, I was it's like, free. it's free. <laughs> no one understood it's free. Yeah. And whatnot. So yeah, we'd go and like, it'd be a good time. And so what was it that drew you to working in that world? So you obviously, you fell in love with TV at a young mm-hmm. age, but yeah. a lot of people don't realise there's a path to that. Well, you know what? Like I realised it. I don't know how to get into TV. When I was younger, mm. you can't apply for a job. Yeah, I wanted to just do work experience on the set. Mm-hmm. So I learned how to start asking questions because I realised TV's not an industry where you go online, you don't go to Zoopla. You have to know people or have an apprenticeship or something of that sort. Yeah. Network your way something to get your foot in the door. Exactly. So I started going to live shows and actually just speaking to random people on set, like annoying that- the cameramen. Just being like, how did you get to this place? Yeah. How do you get this job? Interesting. I want to be here. What do I have to do? And they'll just like tell me something to fob me off. And I'll be like, okay. They'll like take this email. Then I'll email, you know? Okay. Um, I remember I was at the Jonathan Ross show. Love backstage. Jonathan He's one of my favorites. Really? Yeah. I He's love a him. cool guy. Mm. I worked on that show for a bit. Oh. I remember I was backstage. I was just like the production manager. I was in the green room just as a guest. And I was like, do you enjoy your job? Like, mm. do you enjoy your job? Like, I want to be in the TV industry, but I don't know much. Like, do you enjoy it? And yeah. she kind of, like, stopped. was like, it's a bit of a deep question, do you know? Yeah. And she was like, I actually do, as stressful as it is. And I was like, well, I want to do this. How do I get there? Yeah. And she's like, you just need to keep emailing people, keep looking at the credits of shows and contacting people. And that's what I did. Smart. Eventually, she reached out back out to me. She contacted like my tutor at uni and was like, <laughs> Crazy. I get James Corbin's like details. I want, um, if he's interested, I want him to jump on as a runner. And that was literally, that process was just only to work behind the scenes doing teas and coffees. Yeah. But that's what got my Simple. feet in. Yeah, when I was at uni. So that was the moment. Yeah, that's got, got my feet in and I kind of worked out as I was like running and whatnot, what, part of TV I wanted to get into. I liked making stories and I realised I started a YouTube channel when I was younger as well. Mm-hmm. But I was at university and I sort of like formatted it as my own show. I had my friends come on yeah. and I'd like do subject topics and I'd like sort of like cast out of my friends who I'd yeah. have in which video for what. And like that was my way of like creating something on my own while I was studying because I'm a person, I just like to do things. Like yeah. the, when you're writing essays and essays and essays, I get really bored because I'm like, I just want to go out there and make stuff. So starting my YouTube channel was that for me. And yeah, I was able to know that's what I wanted to do in TV, create TV, change the narrative of TV. Especially when I was seeing like shows that show people of color, Mm -hmm. black people, black stories. I kind of wanted to be able to be a person that could contribute to that, to tell more black stories. A lot of the time it would be like coming from a place of like, the hood, drugs, and not exactly crime. if it's a storyline or if it's, a, you know, I'm like, there's more. There's, there's more, more stories here, yeah. Like, there's more that I even identify with that I'd love to see on TV. 
I was like, I'd love to be able to be that person in the rooms making those decisions. Mm. And yeah, I realized it was really white behind that camera. <laughs> and it's not as easy. Yeah, I hear you. And somebody coming from, like, I'm not middle class though, at all. Like, I grew up, you know, in, I'm not, I'm not going to say the ghetto. I never grew up in the ghetto. <laughs> but I grew up in Brixton, you know? Yeah. I grew up around, that's a different environment, you mm. know? Different things. Like, my corner shop money is a different corner shop money from someone else's corner yeah, shop yeah, money. Yeah. And so, but I was sort of grateful for what I had. I don't see a problem mm -hmm. with it. I was content, like happy. But, but you yeah. came from a different world to the one you found yourself in. Yeah, you? yeah. And it wasn't nice to feel like I had to change myself to mm. be able to fit in the space, if that makes sense. Because yeah. it's quite tough behind the cameras and I'm mm -hmm. sure other people listening who have tried to pursue the creative industry in the, you know, broadcast. It's tough, it's tough. Especially if you come with ideas and things that you want to put in. It's kind of like you feel you've got to change yourself up. Yeah. How do you navigate that? Like, what's, what's your, what was your strategy for going from someone making coffees and teas to starting to get in the conversations where you can actually get your ideas heard? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm naturally like a person that likes to be inquisitive and that kind of likes to see what can be different and doesn't like to be uncomfortable. Mm. And I was like, I don't like that I feel I need to talk in a certain voice when I'm here. Yeah. And no one's telling me to, but it just feels like I have to. Yeah. Because I'm seeing this person is, who looks at me and then it feels like if I am to do something like that, like little comments will be made make you feel a bit uncomfortable and I yeah. thought, oh, I need to behave this way so that I can be part of this crew. And you'll see a lot of people that work in TV feel the same way too. Yeah. So I remember I was just, I was still just a runner at this time. And I remember I was working this Channel 4 show and it was a late night talk show as well. And I just remember I was like the only black person working on the show and I was like, this is just entry level to get in the industry. Yeah. Why is it that I'm not only one here? Like I've got lots of friends who study the same course, lots of creatives that are trying to find their way in TV and they're not getting through. Mm. If we needed people, they'd be sending in CVs and like, where where are the people of colour? And I remember I had like an end of sort of season review. And I think there was, there was like a interview to, like, to promote me to do something more. Mm. But it was just in my mind, I don't feel comfortable and I'm not sure why I'm the only that person with colour hair, like, when there's so many other people. So they were like, what like, what did you enjoy about the role? Mm. Um, what do you think? You know, just general, what you yeah, think yeah. improved. They're not expecting you to actually respond. And I was like, there's, I feel like there's not enough for Channel 4. There's, there's not enough diversity here. In the room. Yeah. And I don't understand why not as well. They were like, oh, really? Yeah. And I was like, do you know, like, people? I was like, yeah, I do, in fact. I do. And can I send them your way kind of thing? And mm. yeah, it ended up for the next season, they let me have the role and I was able to bring in at least, like it was like a good mix of rotation, rotor, like with like people of color. And yeah, it was just nice. It was mm. just nice. People were able to come in and they were able to like start their journey in TV. And like, it sounds really silly, but it's that hard. Yeah. It's that, it's that hard. But were it not for you just start. asking the question, Exactly, and like, like people be scared they'll lose their job, yeah. kind of worry about themselves. But I mean, whatnot. in my experience, because I've done I've done a few small things in, in mm -hmm. the TV and radio worlds, mm -hmm. and you do find you know you are one of very few people of color in the room. Often, there's very few women in the room as well, and I don't. In my experience, it never felt like that was happening out of malice. I just think people tend to hire people that look like them and trust people that look like them. And it's not, they're not doing it to be exclusive. But when you meet someone for the first time and they're quite different to you, it might it's be hard. It might, it might be, yeah, you might feel less comfortable. It and it's not, I don't think it is a bad thing. And the fact that you could raise that conversation with them and they were like, oh, actually, do you know anyone who is from a different background to everyone else in this room? Mm -hmm. Can you bring them in? I think that shows that there was actually an openness to it. It just hadn't occurred to them until mm -hmm. they had someone like you who was willing to have that conversation. Yeah, yeah, may maybe that's the case. And I guess, like in TV, there's so much more in between moments than just the job you're doing. Yeah. You spend a lot of time with people, you need to get on. Yeah. You know, f f jokes, fun, banter, and stuff. And 
if there's no one in the room with different, you know, entities, how are they meant to feel comfortable either? Yeah. You know? So, yeah, it, it was just nice, like, practicing using my voice for good or, like, using the spaces I'm in to be able to help others felt good. Mm -hmm. And that could help me tell more real stories when my environment makes more sense. I don't feel I'm saying something that is just out of reach for people. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I enjoyed it. Where do you think that came from, though? Because I'm sure there's been other people maybe in a similar position that got, a, got maybe got their foot in the door to make some coffees and teas. But they never had something in them that said, you got to speak up on this. I want to I wanna feel like the room reflects the world that we live in. Like, why do you think you specifically felt like you had to say something and you could say something? Well, Where does I that feel, come from? I feel like in general, I grew up like learning to speak up for myself. And even for the career path I chose to be in, I had to learn to speak up for that too. Mm. Being a creative in my community, being like from a Caribbean, African background, what does that mean? Like, it's not a doctor, it's not, you know, where do you make money? <laughs> yeah. Like, what is this? So being creative, does that make money? Mm. I had to just fight to be in that position to do that, even to do the course. And is that with family? Yeah, just not even only family, just my social surroundings. Mm -hmm. Like, my friend's parents would ask, like, what, what, so what are you studying? Like, what, yeah. what's going on? I'd be saying I'm studying, like, creative production. They're like, what? what creative is that? production was... What's that? And it's like having to stand up for that. I'd be like, no, I'm going to be in television. I'd like speak into existence what I wanted to happen. I will speak up for it because I know a lot of people, they kind of pick subjects that their make their parents happy rather than yeah. what makes them happy. So I've learned, that's just an example, but there's many things learning to stand up for myself and what I want to do for me. So it's like, why would I stop now that I'm now in the door kind of thing? Yeah. And even now what I do today with modelling and all that, which I'm sure we'll get into, like, I've got to keep speaking. Yeah. If something doesn't feel right, I've got to speak about it. And if I can make life easier for the next person after me, why not? So outside of TV, where was the next step for you? What do you mean? So how did you progress from, you know, running, then, you know, informing and working on shows? Yeah. What came next? Oh, okay. So lockdown came. Lockdown, <laughs> lockdown came next. Um, the pandemic came. I was in uni while all this was going on. Okay, you yeah. know, I was still in uni in my last year. And then during my final year, that's when lockdown came. And the reason why I did all of that was to get ahead so that when I was graduating, I kind of would already be making TV Smart. kind of in a better position. And a lot of people don't do that, you know? Yeah. And not that I'm pointing out. So I, you know, you're you looking. Saw it, yeah. I'm like, oh wait, hold on, what's everyone else doing? You guys, not yet? <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> I, I, me, I've, I'm quite independent and I feel like I'm just always worried about not having my, myself together. So I'm always thinking about the, the next, next thing. Move, yeah. And yeah, I was just like really determined and lucky to be in that position where I was in lockdown and able to, you know, have my foot in the industry. And during that time, it was so scary for students that was like I about to graduate into the real world because it's like you're studying, you're studying, finishing off your assignments, but going out to what? Yeah. People are losing their jobs. The world's closed. <laughs> the world's closed. You're trying to walk into a creative space that you are walking into freelance. Mm. And freelancers who have been working there for years aren't able to put food on the table from their job. So it was, it was a scary time and it made you really think about what you want to do. Yeah. Um... For me, I was able to finish my, you know, my assignments and then focus on my YouTube channel, yeah. making content. So during that time, I was making like content about how I was dealing with the pandemic. I was like living alone. I was um, down in Bedfordshire um, where my university was. Mm -hmm. And I was just like documenting my experience going to supermarkets and stuff, my vlogging camera. And I remember like during that time, I had like a change of environment, even with my like the people that was around. Like yeah. I stopped talking to like friends as well. You know, like when you're just having a refresh and you really have time to really think about what is going on in your yeah. life and what you're doing. That's a lot was changing for me. And like, I was just being able to just do things that I wanted to do for myself. I think the pandemic gave a lot of people a chance to reflect. Who gets on... the opportunity? Yeah. There was Who gets the opportunity chance? to even like really take nearly two months out of their life and not do anything mm. 
not have to go to a job, I have to stay around the people in your house and really just think about what you have Where no choice. Like, like, who, yeah. like, when do you get that opportunity? So that was what that was. And I was just enjoying making my YouTube content. Uh, luckily, I was able to like work remotely still here and there. But I had time to just think and like do fun things. I was doing a lot of like videos. And the reason I talk about the pandemic and when I was vlogging the shopping, I remember like I got an email from BFI at the British Film Institution. Yeah. And they made like this blog article thing saying like the six creators that have like shaped the lockdown experience. Interesting. And they put my video in there. Hello. I was like, what? That's huge. I was like, like, I, bear in mind that, you know, just months before I was going to like talk to how to get in the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to see them like, you know, acknowledge my work. It's a vlog I made, you know, yeah. and it was crazy to me. It was just like good things was going on. Do you know I how think. they came across it? I don't know. I guess one of their journalists was on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> one of their journalists was on YouTube watching coronavirus videos and yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, they, they enjoyed me just talking to my camera yeah. and going to Lidl. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it like I really lo that was the highlight of my day going mm. to the supermarkets what can I bake today like, yeah yeah so during the lockdown I, like, I, on my YouTube channel I talk about you know being a bigger guy and not being able to find clothes I wanted to wear things like that and I'd share that on my Instagram I talk about random things on my platform just things that was in my head yeah. and people were tuning in every week to hear what I was saying. It was nice. Like at that time I had like around 7,000 subscribers. Sick. People would, and they'd respond back. So yeah. it felt like I had a little- A community. Like, yeah, a community of people that cared about what I had to say, my opinions on my life, what I'm doing in my life, kind of thing. Open book vibes. Mm. And so during the lockdown still, I remember getting a DM from a casting director and saying that, oh, we would like to shoot you for this project with Vogue Italia. And I was a bit confused because okay. I was like, do you want to help with production? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm uh, not Behind the camera. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm used to. And I'm, I'm like, I've never done fashion. Yeah. You know, well, that'd be interesting, you know? And so I was like, yeah, why not? Why not? For me, it's always yes, then think about it later on. Like deal with it when I have to. And so I said, yes, I didn't tell anyone. I, thought, I didn't think it was a real thing. Yeah. Um, uh, this photographer, Campbell Addy, I remember saying to him before we were shooting and stuff, I was like, you know, I'm not a model. <laughs> I don't look like these people. Yeah, I don't know what I'm professional. doing here. I'm, but he, you, I don't, what's going on here? And I remember yeah. he looked me in the eyes and said, James, you're beautiful. What are you talking about? I was like, I was a bit taken back. Like, yeah. I don't grow up in a, household where you're told things like that and like, that's not like that's not the love language mm. i'm not really used to hearing that you know so it was just really odd i was like really wow like you think i'm worthy here yeah. to be here today but yeah it was I, I, you know when you just go numb and just do what you have to do yeah so i've never modeled before like i'm the person that takes pictures of my friends right i work in production to make <laughs> what's looking in front of the camera look great not being in front of the camera so it was a bit confusing but i remember just like something clicked something clicked and i remember just doing what i had to do yeah. doing what i had to do and they, they said they got the shot really quickly and i forgot about it didn't tell anyone about it and then it just came out one day. Um, Vogue Italia. And yeah, I was really shocked. I was really shocked. I genuinely couldn't believe it. Because <laughs> I'm like, how, was, how would you find, look at my page, find me kind of mm. thing? I'm not a model for first gig. Yeah. <laughs> that is That's crazy. crazy. Especially because you weren't putting yourself out there as a model. Mm. You weren't looking for that kind of work. No. That is fascinating though. Don't get me wrong, I love to like um, fashion and like to look good and feel stylish and to take my you pictures are very on stylish. Instagram. You're a very stylish guy. You think so? Though. Hell yeah. You think so, John? Absolutely. You always have been. As long as I've seen you around, I'm like, yeah, that guy's got something going on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Like, I don't know, like, I was just shocked. Yeah. Um, but being seen in that way, because like you said, you weren't looking for it. Mm -hmm. What is that like? given the context of the fact that I imagine you've always been slightly bigger. You're quite tall as well. Mm -hmm. You're a broader guy. Mm -hmm. 
So being asked to be a model, when all the connotations of model in my head is like super skinny mm -hmm. or ripped, like mm. I'm neither of those things either. So whenever someone is like, on the odd occasion, someone's asked me to be on camera, I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm the person that takes the pictures. How do you, like, how was that, like that journey for you, knowing what you've grown up with? And I guess all the comments you've had, how would that, like, how does that register in your mind? I don't know. I think at the time I was a bit numb because I was on YouTube and like every now and then you get videos that will go viral mm. and then you'll get more than your community of people that are used to you. And there's people that, that send hate. So I was used to like seeing every now and then, which are really odd, but I'm not normal for the normal person to have, but yeah. like comments come in saying, you're ugly, you're fat, you're too yeah. dark. All these kind of things, I'd see it directly come out, a notification. Wild on my phone. comments. So to me, I remember there was a point where there was a video where there was just like loads of, it's like, like Black Twitter got me as well. Like yeah. <laughs> I was just getting fried. Yeah. Like there'll be little clips that'll be snipped up and put out and yeah. And I was, I'd just look at my phone and it's like, I'm used to this. And if I'm not happy or not comfortable enough, then I'll stop YouTube. I didn't stop. So yeah. that was kind of numbing. A lot was internalized, didn't it? I feel like a lot was internalized and you just brush it to the back of your head. You're like, yeah, okay. And what? But you're saying, I am this and what? And it's like, I'm not what you were telling me I am. Yeah. I am who I am. And they don't know you. Yeah. I mean, that's that's one yeah. of the key things. Is that it's strange on the internet to say some wild things, but they don't actually know you. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, for me, their, their opinions don't matter that much. Mm -hmm. But that's me personally. Like, that's how I managed to put it to the back of my head because I'm like, actually, these people don't know me. And people that do know me, they love me, so. I know that now, I know that now. <laughs> but you know, back then when you, you're just looking at all these people and you're just thinking, wow, and it's a that, lot. It's did not, that ever make you want to quit? Well, at the first, I remember the first time there was like something, I was quite young and it felt, it felt really weird because the people around me don't talk like this. I don't mm. have people come and speak to me. I'm a bit, like you said, I'm a big guy. Like I, I'm able to defend myself in real life. Mm. So when you can't really control that environment, there's a people like saying like nasty things to you. And so it's like, oh, wow, mm. kind of thing. But I didn't stop, <laughs> I didn't stop. No, I didn't stop. Um, I kind of just went, okay, like armored up kind of thing. Yeah, thick skin. Yeah, so I think that helped me in the start of modeling to really kind of not think so much about what people think and just do in the moment. But I think for me to really, really get into myself and really be a good model, I kind of real had to realize that all the things I'm worried about is what people think. But to model, I need to care about what I think about me first before anything. And then that became my mantra. And mm. just being honest and being quite transparent especially on Instagram and so where people are following me going, I love this image of you. And I can say, look like, just like you, today I'm not feeling great. And today I'm feeling better. And yeah. this is how I train myself to appreciate myself, love myself better. And so, and that kind of helped me a lot using my platforms to kind of voice how I feel as well. And I mean, in some ways it helped that you'd already, you'd already mm -hmm. begun building a community around you and your content, people that are familiar with your style, familiar mm. with your voice, familiar with the way you look. So you already had, I guess, backup to kind of reinforce that message for yourself. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, I think. I think so, I think so. And like during the lockdown, the same time that like, I was kind of like doubling down on what I wanted around me as well. And I think that helped. We were you talking know, in terms of like friendships, friends, and all that kind anything. Of stuff. Yes, yeah, anyone that you allow around you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some people, a lot of big people, bigger guys, big girls, or whatnot, or whoever. The people around them, they allow them to get away with saying little things. Mm. You know, little things that may make them feel away when they leave. And Do you mean like left. jokes or digs yeah, jokes, or? digs? There's little things, but because the person they're used to them, are oh, they're not being rude and they just allow things mm. and it is affecting them in a way. They don't want to be a little something said to them. And so um, I'd double down, I'd be like, 
I don't need to say that anymore. Yeah. Even family, I don't need to say that anymore. You know, are you Caribbean? Yeah. Where are you from? Barbados and Ghana. You know, I'm from Barbados as well. Oh, snap. Yeah, Jamaican, <laughs> Bayesian and Kenyan. Though. Okay, dope. I can see you being Ghanaian though. Yeah, I was raised I was raised Ghanaian. That was my culture growing really? up. Really? Yeah. And it, so, I mean, to your point about family comments, like constantly be like, oh, you've put on a bit. I'm like, I didn't need to hear that. Yeah. It's one of those things. Like, it's not, because the, they're not being mean. It's just part I don't of need culture to, hear to just say things as it is, yeah. but not even as it is, just to add an opinion. It's very normal to talk about people's weight, people's skin tone, mm. something that's physically changed. It's a very bad practice. Yeah. And it's something that happens in a lot of like cultural communities. Mm. It's how it is. Oh, why is your body like this? Why have you put on this? Why? Like, it's very normal. And it's like, I'm like, no. Unless you shut it down. Yeah. It and I made it like a, during that lockdown, just that period of looking at things that I like, what I didn't like. It was important for me to take that responsibility and that power uh, the people around me gonna have to respect me in a way that I want to be respected in the same way I want to respect you as well. Mm. And I'd be like, no, I don't need to say that anymore. And it would like shock people could be like, well, cool. Like this is, I always say that. I said, you always did. If you want to say that, then we you know, never spend time with each other, you know? It kind of like setting those boundaries and like, re it's like a reset I did. Mm. And that was important because those immediate people that you have around you if they're feeding in things that make you feel not good about yourself, that's how you're going to feel. You know, they're not trolls. They're the people that you have in your environment. Because those people do know you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what's that's the, the people you allow in your space, the people who you trust, the people you rely on. If they're constantly feeding in like negative things to you, you're going to feel negativity. You're going to speak to yourself like that. And yeah, the number one, the way I talk about myself to myself. That was important as well. That's the biggest deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I've loved watching you develop as a model and embracing it. Maybe you're not thinking about it, but I'm looking at it like, I don't even feel as brave as I feel like you are. Because like, I wouldn't do a topless picture of myself. But some of your images are so strong and striking. And you're half naked. Like, how do you, how do, you do it? I don't know. You know what? I need some tips. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know. even do it at the beach. And I'm not, yeah, I just don't, I don't know. I've never felt that comfortable. Before we uh, before answer that, can we get into that? Like, yeah, sure. How have you felt about your body growing up? I think have you always Have you always been a little bit bigger or not exactly the, uh, the norm? I've always or? been chubby. I okay. had cheeks from, I used to get called like British Bulldog. I've always had cheeks, but again, I think that's a Ghanaian thing. I've always had big cheeks. I've always been quite athletic though and quite strong. So in a lot of ways, I've... I've enjoyed my size because I was always bigger than other kids. So mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard for bullies to maintain their bullying because if once I got up, once I got the courage to step mm -hmm. to them, they didn't want it. Because that's when I mean, you find out with bullies, they normally don't like the confrontation. They're looking for weakness. So I found having that size, being a lot, a lot bigger than kids in school, did help me out a lot. I think people go one of two ways when they're bigger. They're either really mean to other people or they try and look out for other people. And I was always, I always tried to look out for other people. And that's, I was actually really glad that was the case because I'm 5'9", and all my little friends in school are now like six foot, and way bigger than me. If I'd have been the bully, I would have felt terrible now, because I'm sure they wouldn't have let me forget that. <laughs> but yeah, I always felt, in, in some ways, like, like I said, I was comfortable with being bigger, but I never felt attractive. I never felt like the things I thought what I was supposed to look like. Because like I said, I was quite athletic, but I've never been ripped. I've never had a six pack in my life. Even when I was dancing I, and performing, I used to train like twice a day, six days a week. And I've never ever had that kind of a physique. Like genetically, I just don't know if, it, I don't know if that's even possible. And so I guess I've just got to that point where I look good in clothes, so I prefer wearing clothes. What was that point that clicked to you? Because that part about feeling unattractive is really important. Mm because a lot of people feel that way. What kind of clicked for you? When did it click for you? I think unattractive to me was me having a disconnect between what I thought people looked for and what I've experienced people find when they talk to me, when they spend time with me. So you didn't feel desirable? 
No, I just didn't. I, in my head, I was like, every well, guys are supposed to be tall and have six packs and have perfect teeth and perfect hair. But that's like movies and music videos. Like I was an R&B. Like that's, imp- that's important <clears throat> too. Like what you see, what you consume, right. what you see. Exactly. I was an R&B cat. So like growing up, I loved R&B music. All mm-hmm. R&B singers, Usher, Genuine, Tank, you name it. Mm-hmm. For the most part, they were all like the epitome of sexy. In my head, like Tyrese. Everyone goes on about Tyrese's figure and the, when he pulls his top off in, in movies and all of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was never that guy. But growing up, as I, as I became a young man, I started mm-hmm. to see that, I mean, all the guys that I looked up to around me in school that I thought were good looking, that had six packs, were really shit people. Like, they weren't kind. They were really self-centered. They were mean to people. And I never wanted to be that. Mm. And so I, I started to find, I started to feel attractive in the way that I noticed my kindness and my attention that I paid to people drew people to me. I think that was where I found my attractiveness. And it, I, I guess I disconnected it from how I look and then started to wear hats and I dressed myself up in ways that I could feel attractive on the outside as well. But for me, the inside became a lot more important. That's really nice to hear. And it's important that you said that, because people always ask, how does fashion have anything to do with your body confidence? Mm. And the way, the way we dress, the way we, you have to look in the mirror and decide what you're comfortable with, what you like before you leave. You've got, that's how your body is. Right. And the clothes that you put on it is so important as well and can change the way you feel about yourself. A hundred percent. A lot of people Hard. use clothes to hide their insecurities. Oh yeah. So when you start to use clothes to embrace your insecurities, that's a big change in the way you feel and fashion yeah. plays a big part in it. So yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Cause I mean, even like, cause I've got, I've got a big nose. I hated my nose in school. And like people used to call me Michael Jackson and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I, I guess, like you said, having people around you that are making fun of you, yeah. you already have that voice in your head anyway, telling you that you don't look like this and you're not good enough. So having those people around me in school, he, like hearing that over and over again, I was like, wow, this is like, it just reinforces that negative message. But then I remember one time I was backstage at Jazz Cafe because we used to perform there a lot when I was in my music days. I remember oh, wow. I met this lady backstage and she was looking at my face hard and she was like, similar to actually with your experience with the photographer, she said, you're beautiful, you've got a lovely nose. And I was like, I've never heard that in my life. And I didn't, I don't agree with her, but hearing someone see me from a different perspective, it was a white lady as well, so very different to me culturally and physically. Out but she, she liked what she saw. And I thought it was quite kind of her to say when you say like, because was you when you grew up, was you going around a lot of people of color, like other black people? No, my area was. I mean, I grew up around here, so crazy mixed. Like my school was a lot of people from North Africa. We had people from East Europe, people from obviously England. But I'd say yeah, it was crazy diverse where I grew up. So yeah, there wasn't really any. If anything, there weren't that many Africans in my school. Maybe more Caribbeans, because we live in Northwest. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, the, maybe the African thing was the least influence. That's I'd so say. interesting, because yeah. obviously I grew around so many black people and we all have bigger noses. Yeah. We all have different facial features that is part of who we are. So would it even second guess? So yeah. to hear someone else has a different experience is great. Like, I'm listening, I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? But like now, it's weird, because maybe it is a thing that's come with age, but I don't, like, I don't even care. Like, I'm grateful that I have a face that functions and I have eyes that function and a nose that can smell things. Like, I really don't care what they look like. And some people do like the look of my face, so whatever. Like, my mum thinks I'm beautiful. And I think it's, yeah, it just doesn't matter to me so much externally what what I look like, because I can't change it. I mean, I guess you could change it, but I, I don't want to spend money on changing the way I look. And whoever does, and I'm not judging people that do want to do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Me I personally, you. I don't want to have to do that because I'd rather be okay with what's there rather than taking you know extreme steps to change it. But if you need to, by all means, I'm not judging. I hear you, I hear you. I hear you. I'd rather spend my money on clothes and cameras and hats and I trainers. Feel <laughs> I feel, yes. Personally speaking. Yes, yes, yes. But to yes, answer yes. my question, how do you get naked on camera? 
<laughs> <laughs> just in case that is tips. I've never been naked on camera. But to literally just to be topless and so like from it's kind of in because that first shoot I did with Vogue Italia, I, I was wearing a shirt, black trousers and shoes. And in the middle of shooting, Campbell, the photographer, is like, do you mind taking off the shirt? Oh God, I was so, I, I didn't think- <laughs> I would think have in, melted in that moment. I didn't think for one second that he would have asked me to do that. Yeah. And going back, like in school, I would get changed in cubicles, the dressing mm. rooms. I went to a boys' school. You would just get changed, you know? I didn't like people to see my body. Like I felt so subconscious being the biggest guy in the room. I don't want people to look at me. Didn't have to, it didn't put myself in positions where I had to undress in front of other people. And I was in a set in front of like 30 people that day. Damn. And when I'm in go mode, it's just like, okay, like numb. <laughs> and it's kind of like looking back at it, I'm like, oh my days, I'm not wearing a top. But to see it come out and see how much support I got, it kind of became, it went from an insecurity to like something that is so bold. This is for me. me. Yeah. And that's how, literally how it became. And yeah. No, I don't even second guess. Someone's like, oh, that, you know, the shoot kind of thing. And let's yeah. take over the top. So yeah. And how have you found that reception then on social media? Because like you said, it was, it came through Instagram. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now that you've got a platform and actually mm -hmm. you've built a really big audience behind all of that, how have you found that then building on social media and, and the way that it's changed? As much as there's good comments, there's always negative comments too. When we drop things in magazines and so people will say, this is promoting something unhealthy. This is not right. The, the, this is horrible. Fashion is getting out of hand. Why isn't it back to the days where we'd see actual beautiful slim models? And so, so it, it's a variation, isn't it? Mm. Like as much as there's a lot of positivity, there's a lot of negativity that comes my way as well. So I feel, I feel like it's a balance mm. and I can't, I don't, relay how I feel based on the responses. But when you do get genuine responses or you see that you're impacting someone else's life and their lifestyle and the way that they think about themselves, that is so important too when it comes to social media. Has that happened a lot? Yeah, like, I remember when that first time, I got so much messages from people from outside of the country. Oh, I've not, at that time, I've never been to many countries. Yeah. So I was just trying to like really I was speaking to a lot of these people and it would be people that aren't even big. It would be people that have what society regards as the norm. They have the six pack, they have the ripped chest, mm. they are slim, they have the build, you know? And I'd ask, out of interest, why is this inspiring to you? Why is this image of me without a shirt, being a bigger guy, being dark skinned? Or how is this relatable to you? Why is it inspiring? And they'll be like, well, when they were younger, they didn't enjoy themselves because of the way that they looked. They didn't give themselves a chance. And they've, like ever since they've been working on this body and nothing's ever good enough because they've still not accepted themselves mm. in its pure form. And from those responses in those early days, I understood what my definition of body positivity is. It's not nothing to do with size. It's about how you feel about yourself in here and taking care of yourself mentally, physically, all sides of health. Mm. And yeah. It's fascinating that you say though, because like mm. the, oh, why can't fashion go back to the good old days? People weren't healthy when they would stick thin. And that was the trend where you had to have everyone be the same size four, size six. That's like why, that. and also that's not reflective of the real world. Most people don't look like that. That's why I say it's just plain fat phobia because it's the argument's always about health, and I'm like, it's interesting because do you see health? Is health that has a look? Mm. Because when models are under eating, that is beautiful according to you, but it's unhealthy. Yeah, somebody looks bigger, but they on paper 
are healthy, fit, healthy, fit, they just have a bigger build yeah. to you that looks unhealthy. It's fat phobia. Yeah. It's fat phobia. And I'm happy that what some the work that I do makes some people unhappy because that's how change happens. It's never going to be a clean slate. We're talking about changing the industry standard to become normal, to have different body types. So, yeah, when people on social media are unhappy, I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. That's, I don't mind. I mean, it, I think it's important to challenge people's ideas anyway, mm -hmm. in every field. I think, like, even when you're going back to when you're in TV, you walk into a room and everyone looks a certain way mm -hmm. and there's no one in the room that looks like you. You're finding, or we're seeing now in the fashion world, you know, people like Lizzo getting magazine covers. You would never see that 10 mm -hmm. years ago. But we're starting to see people that are more representative. Because mm -hmm. I don't I don't just want to see larger people on magazine covers. I want to see everyone. everyone. Yeah, everyone. Like, that's healthy. We should all be reflected in the Fashion marketing. includes everyone. Mainstream media should include what society looks like, full stop. Yeah. That, and yeah. that's, for me, that's the point. And I think that's one of the things you're doing. Thank you. What is it like Appreciate to walk that. London Fashion Week? Because um, that looks hectic. I, I really do enjoy the runways. I get so nervous before going up. And I think it's because I care a lot about this. Like, the, to see that I'm part of change, part of history whenever I do step on a runway, because most of the time there's not been a plus size male that's walked for that brand or walked even this runway before. It feels really good. It feels, I do feel my shoulders. I've got to really give it my all, rehearse, be in the best place to do things. And it feels really good. I feel really grateful to be able to be a model and be able to walk runways. How do you prepare? How do you rehearse for a runway? And this might sound like a really dumb question, but I've never so walked a walk. runway in my life. <laughs> you learn Just how walking, to walk. <laughs> walking sounds very simple, but if you see in London, people do not know how to walk yeah. in the street. <laughs> like, literally, to walk in a line, walk where the clothes are able to drape and, sh and clearly and able to demonstrate how close the clothes that the designers made is meant to look on your, yeah. bo on your body. So yeah, just watching runways, watching icons from the past, just having my own little something to my walk as well, having my personality in there as well. And a lot of it is just plastering in confidence as I am in person on that runway too, Yeah, regardless of all the people that's watching and the cameras and lights and everything. Is that, I mean, to me, that just looks absolutely terrifying. And I've shot, I've shot a few runways. And even just as a person you on camera. You feel the pressure, right? Yeah. Like the room feels... Silent. Mm -hmm. The room feels tense. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I, I don't know how... I, like I said, when I shoot it, I look at the models and they seem so focused mm -hmm. and in the zone. In your own world, yeah. And it is quite fascinating. What is it like working with like the models and the design, like designers backstage? What is that kind of environment like? I love it, like, because the, these designers, like, they put their whole heart, soul into their designs, and, you know, their designs have stories, and, like, it feels very grateful to, like, be that person wearing, you know, because they've had a mood board in their head from when they were creating that piece, you know, from maybe even years before the stays come, and you're able to, like, be that muse. It's really fun to see. You're bringing the, it to life. Yeah, exactly. In a lot of ways. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. And obviously being a plus size male, I really do ask like designers like about the process of like how they saw this coming together, what makes them want to make their brand inclusive because there's many that isn't. Yeah. And yeah. What kind of answers do you get? Um, a lot of brands, I think especially younger designers, Gen Z, they naturally just want things to be inclusive. They want to see different people wearing their clothes. They don't see it as just one thing. They want different, their things to be worn and seen in different ways. They see different artists that are out and they want all of them to be able to wear their clothes on carpets, on the runway and everything. And it's much more natural. So it's like to them, they're like, I just want people to wear my clothes. Mm. It doesn't. And that includes all different sizes and so and it's refreshing to hear in this like movement that we're in, you know. So And you yeah. feel very much that it's a movement. It is. It is a movement until it becomes normal. Our everyday normal. So definitely a movement and 
I'm a part of it. Who else in this space then do you, would you say is someone you look to as like, yeah, they're doing it? Um, I look to different people in different mediums because they fought for different things. For example, Naomi Campbell, she's fought so much for what a black woman, would, like what black people went go through mm -hmm. as a model in fashion. And so, and just to see her story, Leonie Anderson, um, people in other mediums in music as well, like Stormzy, he's from South London, I'm from South London as well. Just to see his journey of being himself and to be one of the biggest artists in the UK. Just, I take inspiration from different stories and things that I've seen growing up, even people in my family as well. And it all contributes to how I can fight for what I believe in because these people's fought for what they believed in, you know? So, yeah. That's sick. And I mean, if I was, cause I'm trying, I'm now trying to think, where's your, where's, what's the trajectory for you? Like you kind of, you've really grassroots forced your way through mm -hmm. the industry. And now, like you say, you're part of a movement. Mm -hmm. Where is it going for you? So for me, I would, I see myself going in the route of, I'm, si I'm signed in five countries right now. So, Damn. you know, we're represented across the world. Which countries? Um, over in the US, in Germany, in France, in Italy, um, and here in London, you know, and the big fashion capitals. And the aim is to really, I want to be able to call, go in that, that book of like supermodel status, you know? Like, I'd love to venture off into doing creative projects, TV projects as well that sort of show what I do in fashion, you know, as well. And I'd love to break records. I'd love to eventually do the cameos mm -hmm. and stuff in like music videos and in TV shows. Um, I'd love to be able to create a charity that could give back and help people starting up in creative spaces and underrepresented backgrounds who want to be creative in different mediums yeah. as well. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd love to just like have my finger in different pies. Like since becoming a model, I've learned so many other things just by just thinking out of the box how I'm going to represent myself in the best way. So for example, I'm going to fashion at the time of the start, like I'm invited to fashion shows. What am I going to wear there? Yeah. These designers aren't s sizing me. How do I pull things to make sure that I stand out? Because I'm not just going to a fashion show. I'm representing why I think I should be in a fashion show. Yeah. That's the way I would think when I'm going to places. I have to be walking runway as soon as I step into, you know, it's a privilege to be sat on the front row. I don't take it for granted. Even for events as well, where I sometimes see you at, I think on theme and I think, what can I wear today? Who can I pull from? And just through those things that I've learned a bit, I've started in creative direction. Like okay. something I don't even plan to do. Um, by speaking a lot, I started doing a lot of interviews and then I was like, hold on, can I write this myself? Kind of yeah. thing. Despite, you know, and, <laughs> and I've started writing, you know? Um, I had my first fashion edit with Mr. Porter recently and yeah, I got I to that. write it and, you know, sort of like give my own fashion guide. And that's something that I wouldn't qualify to do <laughs> about two, three years ago yeah. when I was just, you know, a uni student studying film and TV. So it's showing me there's lots of different avenues that I'm going to go down that all go to the same purpose, which is to and that was even producing TV, it was all the same purpose, to tell, to have other people's voices heard and, and seen, and that's important. And I get to do that through all these mediums and stuff. So yeah. I absolutely love that you don't want to limit yourself either. No, no, I love doing stuff, innit? But right now I'm like organizing this shoot and I'm doing my first ever time learning about casting, casting for this shoot and I'm doing creative direction for the shoot. and. I just have so many ideas. I'm like, hair, this is the, these are the references I think we should go for. Hairstylists, we're having a chat and then I'm talking to, you know, the makeup artist, what yeah. creative we can go down. It's like, everything is a learning process and I feel like I'm learning something to always end up having knowledge to give out as well. So yeah, yeah. I think one of the, one of the things that you, you've obviously done a lot of your life is 
the willingness to answer, ask questions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That seems to have kept you, mm-hmm. perpetuated you. What other things would you be able to advise people to, to keep in mind when they're trying to break into an industry as difficult or as, mm-hmm. you know, as in demand as TV or fashion? I think you have to have a level of delusion. You have to have a little bit of delusion. You kind of have to walk in and talk as if you already have what you're asking about and what you want and where you want to go. You kind of have to walk into that, walk in that mindset that you're already there. People start to treat you that way. Like, I'm sure you see a lot of it is winging things. And if you have an attitude where it's like, this is already mine, it's like people... It, it gravitates to you. So I believe it's believing in what you want to do next and walking in the mindset of someone who is there. If I want to be a model, I'm going to look at how other models set out their page and make my Instagram page look like a, a mm-hmm. model so that a modeling agency would be, like that's just naturally what I'd want to do. And I advise many people to be like that as well. A slight bit of delusion, but enough that you're safe. <laughs> and just be willing to ask questions, like you said I do before. And just with a positive mindset, being realistic, having balance, being realistic with yourself, but positive to find solutions when there is problems. So, yeah. I love that. That should help. A little bit, be a little bit delusional. Just but a little bit of delusion. Honest with yourself. Yeah, but honest with yourself, yeah. Amazing. Where can people find more about James Corbin? and follow your journey? Um, so you can find me on my Instagram, um, Corbin Captures, C-O-R-B-I-N-C-A-P-T-U-R-E-S. That's on Twitter. My YouTube channel is also Corbin Captures. Um, yeah, follow my journey, please. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for Really appreciate you. Chance. And thank you guys for watching and listening. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the section below. But I would really appreciate a like and a subscribe and check out some of the older episodes because we've had some really good conversations on here and I hope to have many, many more. So I appreciate all of your support. I guess I'll see you guys in another one. Thank you for watching. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Awesome.